Okay. Good morning, everyone. We're so excited to have Ms. Atsuko Quirk with us today. Um, and we're going to begin with our meditation as we always do. So one of our eighth graders, Tracy Dolmo, will get us started. And then Ivan will introduce our speaker. Thank you so much for being here. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you, Tracy. What an honor it is and what a strange and beautiful world it is that I have the opportunity to introduce Atsuko Satake Quirk. Um, I had the pleasure and honor of, of meeting uh, Atsuko at the Japanese embassy um, in another time in a galaxy far, far away, it seems like it was forever, um, and, but it was only, it was less than a year ago, but so much has changed in, in the city and the world where, where we met at the Japanese embassy, and I was introduced to you by uh, Chiaki Torisu. Um, I'll, I'll read your your beautiful biography, but I, I'd like to preface it with some general statements that, that resonated for me in this moment in terms of who you are. You mentioned in, in your biography that you were indeed part of the hereditary military nobility. Uh, you come from the samurai clan and you have the ancient name of Satake, which I understand um, that clan originally started in the Hitachi province. And, and I think it's not without resonance through these many centuries of that storied family. I think it's most significant that although you do not carry the two swords of the Daisho of nobility, you do carry the two swords of a love of the environment and a love of narrative through film and with that you have this warrior sensibility in your fi film of great compassion and justice and bringing healing to the world and not letting anything stop you from doing that so i think that there's a beautiful historical and spiritual resonance um, and you're able to transcend um, through your work um, time and place uh, to find out what is at the heart of the best of humanity. So Atsuko Satake Quirk is your digital media producer, um, your director, a docu documentary filmmaker, environmental advocate, as I said before, and a 21st generation samurai family member from Northern Japan. And you live here in this most amazing and beautiful and most challenging of cities, uh, New York City. Um, you're the director and producer of Microplastic Madness and all of our students have seen it and you met with a couple of our students in the green room who've been so moved by your artistry and power that they're also con considering a career in filmmaking. Um, you're the director of Cafeteria Cultures feature, feature documentary. We have additional credits as a cinematographer and editor. Um, your, your documentary, It's Everybody's Ocean, won Best Documentary Short at the New York City International Film Festival in 2014. And it has been screened in film festivals in 10 countries around the world and counting. Um, school lunch in Japan, it's not just about eating. 2010 and, and Tracy spoke um, reverently about that film is your short documentary that has over 25 million views on YouTube. That movie conveys the importance of quality school meal time, which is close to our hearts and stomachs as well, and has inspired international audiences of students, educators, and food leaders, as well as Kafku's own zero waste cafeteria programs. It is my deep honor 
to welcome you to our school. And you have the stage, Atsuko Satake Quirk. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, that was the most complete, like, uh, you know, amazing introduction that I have ever had. Yes, yeah, um, my family is um, really 21 generation back for my branch, but uh, another century back, uh, centuries back from a uh, long, long, like 13th century. And then uh, maybe I'll just mention that uh, growing, growing up in that kind of household is a, um, you know, always a man. Like the, the house is, you know, for male like females are like serving men you know that was the traditional way and it was deeply the culture in my household and you know i was sometimes questioning about, about those things and then sometimes i didn't even notice that, that was unusual even back then maybe you know 1970s and 80s that um, women will go out to marry somebody else and then leaving the family. So that is the, you know, so that uh, main idea about uh, women in the household. So then um, always like I had a, um, I, I have a older brother. So he is gonna be the man, right? So that he's sort of like, uh, kind of important. Like, is it something, is he more important than me? You know, like I had that kind of a feeling growing up, but of course, you know, my parents loved me and then, you know, I never questioned that part, but the culture, like, let's say, for example, um, I was living with my uh, grandparents and when my grandpa, uh, he's the man of the house, right? Um, when he goes out for a trip and he, when he comes home, then everybody goes to the uh, entrance and then bow to like, welcome back grandpa. That's sort of like the household that I grew up, you know, in. So, um, and then that was sort of normal for us. None of the other Japanese households are doing probably, but in my house, it was still going on something like that. You know, my grandpa gets the first, um, you know, like uh, we, we have a, a bath that uh, use um, the same water that for everybody, so we are not draining. So that grandpa gets the first bath, of course. Right, and and then we are the, the kind of last one. So those are sort of like the, the household that I grew up in. But then I was a little, um, I would say, different from other girls. That um, while you know, even within that kind of household, I liked all the stuff that boys are doing. I never interested in like. Uh, Barbie doll things like I was uh, sometimes play date and going to uh, some girls house and then uh, girls are playing with the dolls and I was so bored <laughs> and like um, that's not fun and then I was more you know interested in just doing like a playing a baseball outside or like climbing up the tree so like you know all kinds of mischief that I go into so that was sort of my household uh, I mean my uh, um, childhood and then um, for this filmmaking career that the first thing probably that triggered me was my uh, my father my dad used to take me to watch movies and then it was 1970s in Japan in a suburb town and there are only like two uh, movie theaters like tiny and it was kind of dirty and it was not kept clean maybe you'll be surprised even in Japan 
and kind of like a you know uh nope bad but like you know, it wasn't like a great uh movie theater but that's the place that we were going and and um and back then there was no rated r or pg-13 and then somehow he took me to movies that's like deeply rated r or whatever <laughs> and i was always the only kid i was only not only female but i was the only kid and always like uh again i was i'm the only you know child here and then like you know looking at the movie it was so um like excited and like the the um you know big screen with the loud sound that that grabs your brain like coming to your brain and then you get so immersed into it and that was sort of like the experience that i had like oh my god movies this is it you know it was so um you know uh very special experience and i was always looking forward to going to movies with my dad um of course that movie said that uh back then people were allowed to smoke everybody was smoking in movie theaters there were ashtrays in each seat and then a the smoke goes out so that the pro the light of the projector goes through the smoke <laughs> and then like when you go to the that kind of movie theater and then your your clothes will smell like you know uh, cigarette smoke for like three days i hated that part but anyway so that was my start of the career probably and then um my dad bought me a, a small camera when i was in third grade that's also an eye-opening experience of actually taking pictures and then i i was just so excited to you know so that bringing cameras to everywhere and then just um taking pictures of my friends and you know um and then the moment that you are looking through this small this like finder it's oh, oh, of course it's not digital so that you look through this thing mm -hmm. that finder right then then you look at your friend here and then if you your friend is looking at the camera then feel like you have a very special moment of relationship with who you're shooting for so that was also very intriguing to me and i loved that moment so then you know i was just taking a lot of pictures a lot of pictures but maybe uh you don't know those um cameras that we put films and then if you take a picture then you cannot see it right away you have to bring the film when you are done with the film you bring it to um develop you know a film developing place and then you have to wait like a couple of days to get prints so those two days that you know until you see the actual pictures like you know maybe that one was good that one was good and then just can't yeah you know, i couldn't wait to actually see those pictures so that was sort of like you know uh my uh filmmaking that's the start of of actually a filmmaking and um from that i was um yeah after that maybe uh when i was in middle school actually uh there's a eight millimeter movie film that movie camera it wasn't digital it was still film but it was actually a movie camera. And the first time I, you know, shot with those movie cameras, I was just so in heaven that now I can shoot movies. 
And also, again, you have to wait two days to see what uh, comes out of it. And that was the time that, you know, sort of really um, exciting to see. And then I was, you know, doing like really a um, uh, little thing here, a little thing there. But then um, around that time, there were a lot of horror movies. Then I fell in love with horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> I was just watching every single horror movie that uh, oh. came, came to Japan and uh, uh, when I was in high school I was actually making horror movies <laughs> with like friends killing each other and like blood everywhere you know that was my movie when I was in high school so um, and I went to kind of a film school kind of college in Japan. And after that, I actually was working in an ad agency, like regular job. And that was kind of exciting. But for me, you know, maybe this isn't my thing. <laughs> then, you know, I came to um, New York City when I was 27 years old. Then I'm here since then. So that was sort of like my life. But uh, what a what a beautiful story! I'm I'm, I'm scribbling down the images of the smoke <laughs> and the and the light pushing through and and you waiting for the film to develop. I so can we open it up to questions? But I hope one of the questions you make it sound so easy. Oh, and then when I was 27, I moved to New York. And I mean, so many of, of our students' families are immigrants. And so at some point, I hope you can also talk about how you made that leap with, you know, to, to New York, which is phenomenal um, in and of itself, beyond the fact that you, know, you, you have this career as a filmmaker. But it, it was just wonderful. When, may we open up, up for questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I want to hear many questions and then, um, you know, even I have some questions to you guys too. So let's just do that. Fantastic life story. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to go actually to Tracy, who you met in the green room first, but she'll have the honor of asking our first question. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Um, so my question for you is, you made a film called probably school time, school meal times. So my question for you is, why do you think um, it's important to have quality school meal times? And why, why do you think, what, sorry, why do you not value, what are your thoughts on schools that value, do not value meal times as much? Right, school lunch in Japan, it's not just about eating. That's uh, actually now over 28 million views on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, please check it out. Um, if you go on YouTube and then put School Lunch in Japan, then my video will come up. So that uh, the first time I actually saw the cafeteria in New York City for my son's school, that I was shocked, right? How many chicken nuggets are on the floor? And back then, like, they were using styrofoam trays, which we got rid of. But styrofoam trays and the kids are just throwing the whole thing into like big garbage bins and trays are on the floor. Nobody cared. Uh, uh, milk containers on the floor, milk spilling and then nobody cared. And I was like, wait, this is a school, right? And I was just so shocked. And after that, Even more shockingly, right? The kids didn't clean up after themselves. And then, and then I asked actually um, one of the staff members and uh, uh, it was uh, actually a parent coordinator who was taking care of the, the lunchroom. Can't like, do they like, do they need to clean the floor or anything? Like, you know, I was sort of like really, you know, uh, asking her and she was like, oh, kids are not supposed to clean the floor. 
that's custodian's job. That was my welcome to America moment. I was like, this country needs my help. That's <laughs> what I thought. And I went to the principal's room and, you know, we got to do something. And of course, principal wanted to do something, but, you know, the short staff, the short, uh, like, uh, you know, the lunch period is really short. Kids need to have um, enough time to eat, you know, blah, blah, like a blah, blah. It's like, uh, can I try something? And um, she was, of course, if you want to try something, please. And I just wanted, like, how about students? Students are there. We don't need adults. Students can take care of themselves. And then I sort of brought in a Japanese style, it's called cafeteria ranger program to just, you know, for monitors will, will oversee the sorting. And so that, that kind of, you know, went well. But um, answering your question, Tracy, quality of the meal time is really, really the, the big difference that I saw between the Japanese model and that's a US model, which I believe the East Harlem school is doing much, much better than the regular public school. And your philosophy is really close to, you know, uh, nurture the uh, uh, appreciation to the food or gratitude. And um, so another thing, so that, um, for us that leaving no food waste is one thing that we, we weren't allowed to do kind of like it was like a, for us it's a, like a crime in a way that you know you're like because all the parents will say like you know farmers worked hard to make this rice and you know, why why you were just wasting so so that kind of culture that we're coming from and seeing how New York City public schools operating uh, lunch, uh, lunch periods are just so far and so like shocking. And I really wanted to show that Japanese model to um, New York City school, uh, Department of Education, uh, school food uh, people. So that was the intention of making that small video. And then I did the presentation to a school food people and they were really blown away. And um, actually some of them are like, we want to move forward and we want to do something. You know, if we don't start anything, then, then we're going to go backwards. <laughs> you know, we have to start somewhere so that they actually uh, did last year um, pilot of scratch cooking in some Bronx schools. So they are trying to be better and making progress and we work together with them. And so anyway, so go back to Tracy. So that uh, lunch is like you eat every day in school and why you are uh, wasting the time from this school day of not learning anything. The Japanese model of sort of like the lunchtime is a uh, instructional time. That's something that the period that you learn something, right? So that's sort of like a basic, like a base difference that, you know, like uh, here, the first time I saw how kids eat here in uh, public school, public school cafeterias felt like they are getting fed instead of having lunch. That was sort of like an impression that I had. So then this lunchtime is a great opportunity for kids to learn a lot of things for lifetime skills. And um, so that's sort of like my, you know, philosophy that uh, I really wanted to bring in to uh, US style lunch operation. And I also, uh, sorry, I'm just talking too much, but um, what bothered me looking at the, uh, my son's cafeteria, when kids were 
getting the actual meal from the lunch ladies, not many kids were thanking them. That bothered me so much. And I counted one day and there were five students thanking them out of 95 students. So that's where the change needs to come in, right? So, um, so that's sort of like my start of this environmental activist career. All right, sorry, uh, I talked too much. Let's go to- No, the it's, it's wonderful. Not at all, not at all. We'll go to um, Catherine Leon next for her question. Hi and good morning. As an environmental advocate, you must put ideas out there in order to try to solve our problems in our world. My question for you is, what is your format in coming up with ideas? And what is your strategy in getting your ideas known or recognized by the world? What a great question. Like, great question. I'm excited about talking, you know, uh, about that issue that um, you guys will be, you know, into this very, very complicated world that you have to, you know, surf through this. And now we don't know, you know, what's going to happen next year or like a month, you know, a month ahead, right? Really unusual things or unexpected things could happen. You guys need to live in that. So for me, we really need to teach young people that they have to have a skill to make a change, which our philosophy is, you know, our, uh, the important things, there are some important things. Let's say, if you have a topic, whatever the change that you wanna make or issue or problems, then you really want to analyze first, you want to have a data, and uh, you want to have a visual. That's us. Those are the three important elements that you want to have when you want to make a change, okay? And always you have to have evidence, right? What, what are the things that you want to change is you have to know the current situation first then how you want to change or what you want to change, that will be clear. But until you have the current situation analyzed, it's not quite clear, right? So now these three things, let's say, uh, for example, if you want to reduce waste in your school, then you have to do, a, let's say, waste audit to see how much waste that currently have before you do anything. That before, after comparison is important. So before you do anything, you have to actually do a waste audit. See, sort everything, how much and what kind of garbage you have, right? And then take a photo. That's also important to make a change these days. Then, now those data, what this data is telling you, think about it. If you see a lot of chip bags and snack wrappers and plastic bags coming from a specific store near your school then maybe you can do something with the store then you have to have a, a reusable bag for students and then maybe you'll talk to the store owner right to do something right but you have to show what the garbage look like in your school to talk to him or her that speaks 
otherwise oh we have a lot of uh garbage i think that's from you know a, a lot of them are from your store and we're gonna do something it's like you know so vague and then that owner wouldn't listen to you but if you have a data and a photo out of 130 items 75 are probably coming from your store that changes the power of the storytelling okay so that is the first step looking at the current situation taking a data and take a photo showing the photo to the owner wow those are those are from our store then that really start the conversation right so then from that now you have some kind of campaign or uh, action of some sort in your school, right? You have to educate other students, educate teachers, maybe you some uh, events of let's try zero waste challenge day, right? And see how uh, little waste that we can go. And then zero waste challenge day, you take a photo compared to the one that coming from before, right? Then see what are the, the garbage that's still here, right? What's the next step would be? Data will tell you what needs to be done, okay? So that's sort of like an important um, recipe for change for us you can actually take whatever the issue that you feel like you know needs uh needs to in, be improved or needs a change um, you first look at the current situation and uh, taking the data and analyze it okay so that's sort of like the make change thing and then now you as an individual start as one person find somebody else that could help you or somebody who can do it together that's going to be two and making it as a class-wide that's maybe 15 school-wide 150 right so then now you can show to other schools that hey this is the east harlem school that this action this is before and after we reduced blah blah number of plastic items in five days that's a great storytelling that you can do to actually teach other schools now becomes district wide or east harlem wide maybe right so you can reach out to other schools to do that now you know how to do that so then you can teach other schools to do that so that's how the change happens right from one person to two people to class to school to dis district to city to state and national you can start that all right everybody has a potential to start a big change in your school all right beautiful wonderful science art and advocacy wonderful yes all right i'm gonna go to alexa for our next question alexa is logging on from one of our classrooms here at school hi, hi. good morning um, I watched your film and I was really inspired by how the students were talking about plastic and their and how they were really interested in this topic. So my question for you is how did it make you feel to see this level of interest coming from them? Uh, sorry, uh, the, the sound was a little breaking up. Can you repeat the question part again? Sure. I watched your film and I was really inspired by how the 
Wait, Alexa, sorry. maybe I can translate for you a little bit. I think she's having some feedback since there are multiple computers in that room. Um, oh, okay. But Alexa's question is, you know, she was so inspired by all the students in your film who were talking about plastic and the earth and, um, you know, you motivated them so well, just as you were just motivating us. Um, so how did it make you feel to see this level of interest coming from students? So this is actually the story of, you know, 56 fifth graders, right? The movie is. But for us, once, you know, um, the first time we went into the school that we fell in love with the school because of the tie, like a strong sense of community that they had. And their version of storytelling about this issue was very, very inspiring to us. So we gave them the like tools, but for me or um, us that they are the ones actually took my hand to go into their journey with, with them. So that was the sort of like the movie um, is about. It's not us making the movie, it's them making the movie. It's their film, right? So we actually did the filming and then the editing and the recording, but it's, it's their film, which is a great honor to actually, you know, work with those amazing students. And some of them are still with us to actually, we have a um, alumni mentoring program that some of our alum, uh, program alumni um, are with us, like, one, you know, meet once a week to do um, public speaking uh, opportunities. And we're doing a podcast and, you know, all the fun stuff. They're in like middle school and high school. So, um, you guys are all amazing too, right? So that you guys can just start your own storytelling about any issues, right? You have your specific life experience in, uh, in your school, in your house, in your neighborhood that only you can tell. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of like, um, you think about those things and then uh, you can be a filmmaker. Is it, is it answering your question? Sorry. <laughs> yes, absolutely, very much. Um, we're gonna go to Alan Molina next. Alan is also logging in from the classroom here at school. Hi, Alan. Hi, uh, hi. Um, my question for you is, Adidas has partnered up with Parley in 2015. Could you just state that, say that again, Alan, just take your time. Adidas has partnered up with Parley and has made recycl reusable, recyclable sportswear. Their goal is to make a reusable shoe by 2022. So my question for you is, what is your take on and thoughts on one of the most biggest sporting companies to make, to help reduce plastic. Right, there are a lot of companies actually doing that, right? Um, that it is very, very important those leading companies are, are taking this issue seriously. It is, if you think about it, that uh, ocean plastic, right? That uh, whatever the, that comes up to the, the beach and then they're making something out of it which is great, but then um, we have to go in a little deeper that if you make something like let's say sneakers, then when you are done with those sneakers, where would that go? Can you recycle it again or not? So that's sort of like a next step that we have to really look into as a society. But as one step forward that all those uh, big companies are taking uh, those initiatives to 
make those uh, ocean plastic into their products, which is great. And then people will know about this. People will be, you know, buying those more than just the virgin plastic made uh, other sneakers. So I think um, it is a great thing to actually publicize this, uh, you know, this issue. Wonderful. Um, we're going to go to Sitlali Ramon next. And she has a question about some of your family history. Oh no, Sitlali, we're having a hard time hearing you. I think you need to speak up so we can hear you through your mask, okay? In your biography, it states that you are the 21st generation samurai family member. So my question for you is, growing up, did your parents or grandparents tell you, tell you stories about your ancestors? If so, may you please share one story you really love? That's nice, actually. Uh, one story is that uh, my family was located um, kind of near uh, Tokyo, where the, the capital is. And then uh, when there were, uh, there was a big battle between two different uh, families, right, rising in, in Japan. And this one family, it's called Tokugawa, and, and the other one is uh, Mikawa. And then those, you know, were fighting. Our family was actually going to go with this, this side. Mm -hmm. And then they actually started uh, traveling, means walking, to, towards the battle area, which is like, you know, 300 kilometers away, like, you know, 200 something miles away. But then once the battle was already on and this side got beaten and then this Tokugawa won, my family heard that, that, oh, so our side actually lost. And they went back to, uh, you know, because the, the battle was over. So the, uh, our family went back and then sort of like, you know, uh, pretend it, like nothing happened. <laughs> that the new, you know, Tokugawa family would would know that our family was gonna actually go against them. So that they went back and sort of pretend it, that nothing happened. But of course, you know, this family found out that our family was uh, going against this family so that uh, our family got sent to uh, actually far uh, north side of Japan to have uh, some land instead of having near them. So that was my story, uh, that I, my favorite story. Of was it Akita province that they were sent to? Yes, yes, uh, Akita uh, prefecture now. Right, that's, the, that's where my family kind of sent to. So. Wonderful. Exciting. Oh my goodness. I, I have, yeah, I have one question uh, to everybody. Is there anybody who has um, your own YouTube channel? Anybody? No? It, oh, okay. Well, if, if you want to start one, is there anybody who wants to start one? <laughs> All right. Oh, good. I think go. they're scared to admit it. I, I think a lot of them want to. I'm sure. Elijah, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, for raising hand. Yeah, I mean, if um, somebody wants to make videos or uh, film, then, um, you know, I'm sort of willing to willing to talk to um, any of you in person. I mean, wow. one on one, if you wow. want. Wow, that's to, yeah. amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next question then. Sure. That's so generous. Thank you very much. 
Um, we want to be mindful of your time, though, this morning. Do you have time for two more questions? I have time for 100 more questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we've got a couple more. Um, we will go to Jocelyn Santa Maria next. Hi, good morning. Good morning. What are some feature documentary film projects that you hope to work on? The next, next one, there are two ideas that I have. One is about school lunch. Uh, compared to U.S. and Japan, there, I mean, we talked about how great Japanese style, Japanese model is, but there are things that Japanese school lunch system can learn from U.S. system. So those are the things that uh, could uh, be my next film, which, you know, I don't know uh, yet, so another idea is a, uh, we have the program alumni whose name is Rebecca Savanam. She's from Bangladesh and uh, she became a very strong climate activist. And she spoke at the uh, climate uh, strike uh, big stage last year. If she's invited to, go to Bangladesh to actually work on some of the climate issues, then maybe we'll follow her and make a movie out of it. Because there are millions of, um, you know, people in Bangladesh actually dislocated from the flooding and the climate crisis. While that's happening, the migration there are a lot of women actually vulnerable to, to get into human trafficking. So there are those human rights issues are uh, deeply connected to climate issues. So that's what she's really focusing on. So if that happens, then, then maybe that's going to be our next movie. Amazing. Wonderful. Okay, we're gonna to go to Leslie Martinez for our last question of the day. Leslie's also joining us from school. Okay. I would like to thank you for being our host full time speaker. In Leslie, just make sure to speak up a little bit. Leslie. It was, it was so inspiring to see younger children talk out about this. My question for you is, what were some of the most difficult challenges about filming this film? And can you share some of your experiences overcoming them? Okay. It's a great question. Can you ask it one more time? I think we had trouble hearing you. You gotta speak closer to the computer. Talked about how plastic has affected our oceans immensely. It was so inspiring to see younger children talk out about this. My question for you is what were some of the most difficult challenges about filming this film? And can you share some of your experiences overcoming them? Okay, challenges uh, about this uh, whole uh, filming. Um, first one was actually scheduling. <laughs> because we wanted to do a lot of different uh, classes, but of course, schools are busy, right? And, and that school teachers are really over-programmed in a way that, you know, it's really hard to take instructional time. But we did have double period once a week once with a week. each class but we had to sort of expand into like taking uh, a time for, let's say, yellow, um, yellow class, math class, art class, <laughs> so that we spread out to, to do other, uh, you know, subjects that related to this whole topic. So to, you know, make up um, some of the time that we, uh, we know we wanted to have 
but still that school, um, the principal was very supportive. Otherwise it wouldn't have happened. Um, the principal was really supportive and the teachers were very uh, amazing. So, uh, but scheduling the time was probably really difficult. And then also when we're in the classroom, kids are loud <laughs> and of course that the sound was really challenging that always we have that enormous uh, noise and even the, uh, you know, like a student really saying the great things, but right next to her that, that somebody was screaming for something else and like, oh, but we made it work. <laughs> so uh, the sound, was, yeah, sound was also challenging. Um, so the, for making a film, you know, you, when you um, shoot something, you have the digital file of uh, all the video clips, individual, uh, individual video clips, right? And then you bring into the computer and then you need to uh, edit those. So you will find, you know, this shot and this shot will go together and, you know, those things. And then after those things, then you go with the sound and then uh, sort of sound cleanup in a way. And then also the same, if same person are talking from this shot and this shot, and then if the sound, it sounds different and it, it feels weird so that the, it should sort of sound the same, then you have to sort of go into those sound waves and then you know, change the settings and then makes it look like, you know, makes it sound like, you know, the, the same person is in the same room with the same volume, with the same tone of the voice. So those are very, very daunting things that happens to filmmaking. So that was, that was uh, especially challenging. Thank you so much, Ms. Quirk. That was an amazing presentation. We learned so much. Um, I'd like to take in all that you've shared with us by um, just sharing in a brief meditation once again that um, Tracy can lead us in. And then Ivan will offer some final reflections if that's okay. Thank you, that's amazing. Great, all right, Tracy, you're up. <laughs> One, two, three, Nicholas Moore is involved right here. Cameras. One, two, three. What a wonderful, wonderful morning. Um, Atsuko Satake Quirk, um, Subarashi Presentation Arigato. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I hope you know that you're a part of our school family. Um, you brought the world uh, closer and more deeply to us in terms of environmental peril and possibility um, through your wielding of the Daisho of and love for the environment and your skill as a filmmaker um, and you're carrying uh, a tradition of, of warriorhood, uh, being a gentle warrior uh, as a 21st generation member of the Satake clan. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm so grateful your work resonates and you resonate through time and sound and light. And uh, thank you so much for bringing your wonderful work and your wonderful life to our school this morning in such a powerful and inspirational way. Thank you so much. And do you have any final words for our community? Thank you so much for uh, you know having me here. I'm very, very honored to meet all of you. And you guys are gonna be the next change makers, right? So um, I'm sort of happy to continue the conversation, whatever that you guys wanna do, right? 
Um, and then also, um, Catherine, if uh, we share the feedback form link, then students can fill out the feedback of the movie. That would be wonderful. Absolutely, yes. We've shared that with their teachers and they're gonna work on those um, this morning, actually. Writing. That would be, that would be wonderful. Yep. And, uh, you know, hope to actually, you know, see you in person. I mean, you know, if, if this was the regular time that I can go into the school, then I just want to just grab the camera, just go into the, the you know, school and meet all of you now. But, uh, you know, um, the time will probably come and, you know, yes. we'll just keep the conversation. Well, thank you. It, it was, it was wonderful. It's good to see you after all this time and wonderful to see your work again. And then we hope we, we meet and you visit us soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Hi. Who made that little baby sound? Hi. I think that was maybe Blessings. She was saying bye. Oh, okay. I thought it was Kareem. No, Kareem's got her, her war face on. She looks like she's samurai. Why is she giving us mean face? If you're logging on from home, give me that. if you're logging on from home, you need to stay in the meeting. I see people logging out as soon as our speaker leaves. We just lost five people, and it'll be hard for me to figure out who those five people were. But this goes for everyone who is logging in from home that you must stay in these meetings until we tell you that you can go. Hey, Ms. Duncan, I you know I think we need to do grades and all. I, for me, the only grade that, that's useful, though, deeply, is giving them an F. If somebody logs off early or doesn't log on, they just flat out get an F. But um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful job you guys did, uh, particularly uh, the eighth grade. Um, thank you, Ms. Marwa. Um, I, I thought you guys asked wonderful questions. Your delivery was strong. What did you think, Ms. Duncan? I thought it was great. Um, you know, we, we had the speaker series down to a, a science um, over the summer and I knew that our first one this fall with um, folks logging in from school might be a little challenging, but um, thank you for your patience to the eighth grade students who asked questions and to their teachers who I know are managing a ton um, in the classrooms and, yes. you know, figuring out speakers and audio feedback and all sorts of things that um, we know that you're juggling and um, we really appreciate your your patience and your hard work. But I thought it was really great. Really, really yeah. wonderful. Yeah. What did you think, Ms. Knowlton? Is Ms. Knowlton on? It is. Hi, in my office. <laughs> Hi, Courtney. Hi. I, I thought she was wonderful. What a, yeah. what a story. And oh, she's worked so hard to um, yeah, what you said, like activism and art, it's, it's incredible. And I, um, you know, I think our group did a really good job. I know that it's, it's a lot for everybody to manage the masks and the technology and it, you know, this is the first time we did it in this way. So um, we were used to doing it from home and now we're going to get used to doing it from here and we will it will evolve for the kids and teachers to figure out the best way for everybody so thank you for being patient and being focused on the most important thing which was the speaker and then like